The following interview was conducted with William A. Richards, Ph.D., the Department of Psychiatry at Bayview Medical Center at Johns Hopkins University for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, September 2nd, 2009, in Stewart Center. And also sitting in is Stephanie Schmidt's uh, colleague in the Archives and Special Collections. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Dr. Richards. We're pleased Thank to you. have you here. I'll start by if you'll tell us where and when you were born and your parents and early years. <laughs> well, I, I uh, was born in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, a little mining community near Marquette called Nagani. Uh, parents were teachers. I was the second of three boys, uh, May 22nd, 1940. Okay. Um, what was grade school like your early years? Was it a small school, a large school? Well, we had one grade school and one high school, and oh, there was a Catholic school. But <laughs> it was a very small uh, mining community. Sure. What sort of mining did they do? What type? Iron mining. Iron mining. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, what about high school? Tell us a little bit about that. High school. Um, was it a large school? Were there any student clubs that you belonged to? You're really asking for ancient history here. Let's okay. see. Was it? Do you uh, was it? Was yeah, it, it, was, it was a very good school. We okay. had a very uh, high quality uh, music program, a lot of support for uh, writing. I remember when I look back on it, I'm kind of impressed that this little school in the middle of nowhere uh, had quite a program. Had, it was so high quality sure. in, in many ways. Um, was it close to where you lived? Could you go back, walk back and oh, forth yes. to school? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. You could walk anywhere there. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. What's the size yeah. of the community? Was not must not have been too large. No. I, I'm not sure what the population would have been, but uh, not more over probably 2,500 or so at that time. Very nice. Yeah, very, very good. Very quiet. Okay. Then um, let's talk a little bit. Uh, after that, did you go on to college? Yes. Um, let's see, to follow the themes that lead into the research here. Uh -huh. um, I grew up in uh, the Methodist Church uh, in Nagani. And um, in junior high school, I remember uh, uh, trying to decide if I should be a scientist like my father was. He was a teacher of chemistry and physics and then became a uh, high school principal, or if I should uh, um, go into music. I was uh, fairly talented as a pianist and was studying a pipe organ in my junior high school years, and I loved music. And somehow I resolved that in seventh grade by deciding I was going to be a minister. And so I uh, left northern Michigan, went 500 miles south to Albion College, still in Michigan, uh, in ten, as a pre-theological student. And, you know, I was very clear I was going to uh, be a pastoral minister in the Methodist Church at that time. So I uh, became a philosophy major and psychology minor, sociology minor in college. Very good college experience. Uh, also, they had a wonderful new pipe organ I got to enjoy and uh, uh, worked in music um, at a nearby church and so on. Uh, but good years. Uh, and then I went to Yale Divinity School. Mm -hmm. <coughs> First time I went, I had been so far east, you know. How did you happen uh, to select Yale? Was it a faculty member suggested? Or? No, oh. I, well, I, I think it was uh, because I, even at that stage, I knew I wanted an interdenominational seminary as opposed to a purely Methodist seminary. And um, the Yale University had people from all different faiths and even world religions. and. Uh, uh, I just knew I wanted a broader framework for my life and studies. And uh, I was lucky enough to be accepted and 
uh, went there. And at the end of the first year at Yale, uh, you had to uh, declare at that time, it's changed now, but a specialization, whether it was pastoral ministry or chaplaincy or uh, teaching in religion or whatever. I think they had five different categories. And I realized I wasn't ready to choose. And right at that time, a great uncle of mine, who I had only played cards with once in Canada, died and left me just enough money for a year abroad. And so I decided I was going to go to Germany and study. And I went to the University of Göttingen uh, at that time, at the very western edge of or eastern edge, rather, of uh, Germany, right near the East German border. Because it was divided. Then. Yes, it was still divided then. Yeah. It was, this was 1963, the year Kennedy was assassinated. Um, and I went there to study theology, because all these big names were there. Uh, but when I got there, I discovered that I was pretty bored with these pedantic theological courses, you know, quibbling about the meaning of different Hebrew or Greek words. And uh, because of the structure of the German university, I could sit in on any classes I wanted. You know, you just appear, and if you appear enough, the professor signs your Studienbuch, they call it, that proves that you were there. And in the department of uh, psychiatry, they had fascinating courses such as uh, Religions Psychopathology, the psychopathology of religion, uh, self hypnosis, uh, psychosomatic medicine, seminar on uh, religious delusions of schizophrenic patients. Um, and I just found myself more and more. That's where my heart was. It wasn't in biblical studies. Sure. And then, topping it off, and this is uh, probably what's most important, in the, uh, just behind the dormitory I was living in, was a psychiatric clinic where uh, a psychiatrist, Hans Karl Leuner, was doing research with psychedelic drugs. And this was 63, everything is still legal, open, and I had no idea what a psychedelic drug was. Um, there were signs hanging on the light posts in campus that said LSD stood for the Liberal Student Democrats. <laughs> and, uh, but I had two friends who uh, took part in Leuner's research. He was looking for student volunteers. And uh, one had uh, regressed to childhood and experienced himself sitting in his father's lap. And his father had died in the war, and it was very meaningful to him. And another one had had visions of SS men marching in the streets and so on. And I thought, gee, that, I've never really seen a decent hallucination. And I might get some insight into my childhood. So I went over and applied for the study, whatever the drug was. And at that time, the screening was essentially limited to uh, how often do you get drunk. And I didn't get drunk very often, so I was in. Uh, this was also before supportive set and setting were recognized in research with psychedelics. So I was led to a, this little basement room, this little cell with kind of a bed and an end table uh, that looked out on the university garbage cans. And um, I was given an injection of psilocybin, of which is, I think you know, the ingredient of the uh, so-called sacred mushrooms. Um, and I was left alone. And so I kind of lay back and I drew on my uh, Methodist piety because I was studying my dreams and I wanted to resolve any childhood conflicts that were important. And um, to my great surprise, instead of a childhood conflict, this very beautiful transcendental 
uh, form of consciousness opened up that at that time I didn't even know was possible and it was certainly not my expectation for the day. Um, uh, so I was just awestruck by that experience. Uh, there was a lot of imagery of a uh, uh, kind of Middle Eastern Islamic domes and Gothic arches, and I seem to have an empathy for even the uh, style of handwriting of uh, Sanskrit or Arabic. Uh, and there was a glimpse of a very uh, wonderful, unitive, eternal state of mind. Uh, so I became known in the clinic as that interesting American who had the mystical experience. And um, these other research subjects generally were not having this type of experience. Uh, the la there was no supportive set, there was no preparation, and they were using very low dosage. And for whatever reason, I just happened to uh, be close to that type of experience. At that time in the history of psychedelics, um, Leuner, uh, Dr. Leuner had just published this book called The Experimental Psychosa, The Experimental Psychoses. And it, you know, outlined all the different paranoid and panic and uh, mentally psychotic like states of consciousness that frequently occur when the drugs are just administered to people without uh, uh, preparation. And uh, he, in his book he has a little, about a third of a page, a little paragraph that's called Cosmic Mystical Experiences. And in that book he says, well just for comprehensiveness I should include that every now and then this rare type of experience gets reported. So I was one of his sources of information about this very special type mm -hmm. of experience. Mm -hmm. um, the research design was comparing t uh, two kind of a short-acting derivatives of psilocybin called CZ74 and CEY19 in two dose levels. And so I agreed to receive this drug four times. And the next three times were not mystical experiences at all. They, they were interesting sensory chains and psychodynamic insights, but nothing like I had remembered in that first session. Uh, and at the end of the fourth one, I found myself uh, beginning to doubt the first one, like, was I just kind of naive and gullible? You know, had I read my uh, studies of world religions somehow in, into this experience? Was it really transcendental insight, or was it just kind of nice sexual pleasure? And uh, I was just trying to, because uh, I couldn't understand why I hadn't, it hadn't happened again. Um, and it was at that time that uh, my good friend Walter Pankey uh, appeared in Göttingen. And he had just completed the so-called Good Friday study in uh, Boston as part of his thesis. And he was on a traveling fellowship to study uh, sites in Europe where psychedelic research was happening. And the main center happened to be Göttingen in, in Leuner's clinic. So he had, he and his wife and uh, two children at that time, had uh, rented a place and settled down in, in Göttingen for six months. So we met in the clinic and very quickly uh, bonded with one another. And I told him about my first four experiences and he started telling me what, what had been going on in Boston with Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert and Ralph Metzner, names I hadn't heard before. Sure. Um, and uh, then Wally suggested to Dr. Leuner, let's do a fifth experiment. And let's just raise the dose a little bit 
and give Bill Richards uh, one more session with psilocybin. And let, instead of this little basement room, let's do it upstairs in a nice room with some plants and some light coming through the windows. And uh, let's use some music. The only music in the first session actually had been uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, garbage cans outside. The, the uh, men came and collected the garbage during my session and all these metal cans. I remembered it as tinkling temple bells during the, <laughs> the period of drug action. Um, but anyway, so we had this fifth session and uh, Wally and I went out and bought a copy of Brahms' Requiem and uh, some good Bach and some wonderful, wonderful classical music. And that fifth experience, uh, uh, the best I can say is that it, it took me back into that mystical state, or I can't even say it took me, it, that w form of consciousness opened up uh, with such a uh, convincing intensity um, that I have never doubted the validity of it since. Mm. You know, that it, it wasn't that I had exaggerated that first session, it was that I had already forgotten 80% of it. You know. And it was just over and over, you know, uh, just uh, drilling it into my consciousness, sort of, that this is this mm -hmm. is valid and this is important. And of course that became a, a pivotal uh, experience in my whole professional life. And uh, kind of from that point on, I clearly was uh, oriented not towards pastoral ministry, but towards teaching and research in the psychology of religion. And um, I became, uh, um, I can't say employed because I never got paid, <laughs> but uh, there were various English-speaking people who would come through Lawyer's Clinic and would want to have a uh, psychedelic session because it was legal there. Mm -hmm. And Loiner had good quality drugs he could give to people. Sure. And he wouldn't have time to guide them through a session and prepare them. But he'd say, well, there's, there's this guy, Bill Richards, this graduate student, you know, maybe he'll do it for you. So I got into, this was back in early 1964, uh, guiding people through uh, their psychedelic sure. sessions. Okay. And uh, ever since, uh, uh, that's kind of been a, a theme of uh, my life in various research okay. contexts. Right. Yeah. Well, then um, at one point, then you decided, you got a PhD from Catholic University. That, that, was, that was down the road a bit. Okay. Um, when to just follow, the, would you like me to just yeah, follow the ahead. academic that theme what here? What came next? Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at, I went back to Yale and finished the degree just because oh, okay. I like to finish things I start. Right. Uh, but, um, and I even uh, did get ordained, though I, that, that wasn't, uh, again, just because I felt I had paid my dues and I should <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> complete it. Right. Uh, but then I went to uh, Andover Newton Theological School mm -hmm. uh, where they had a very fine uh, program in the psychology of religion with Walter Houston Clark. And I did a second master's there with mm -hmm. Walter. Um, and then I went to uh, Brandeis University. Um, interesting story, it, I, I wasn't formally mat matriculated there because at the very last minute, at the end of August, the dean refused to approve my admission by the psychology department for my doctorate there because he was afraid that I might sell drugs on campus or something, you know, which of course I would never have done. But uh, I did say I wanted to do my doctoral thesis in the area of psychedelics. And uh, so um, Abraham Maslow resolved that 
conundrum by appointing me as his, one of his research assistants. So I got to study at, at, Brandeis. at Brandeis, free for charge, and sit on any, in on any classes I wanted to. Uh, but Brandeis has no record that I was ever there. <laughs> <laughs> observer, volunteer, <laughs> right. something like that. But anyway, I did get I to there. study <laughs> with, with Maslow, who sure. was, a, as you may know, a, a very great Jewish mystic who uh, never needed to take psychedelic drugs. Sure. And uh, uh, it was a real honor to uh, study with him, as it had been Walter Houston Clark at Andover Newton. Uh, but I knew I wasn't going to get the magic letters after my name by staying there. And uh, I had also married the year before, and my wife was a psychiatric nurse from, uh, from Germany. Uh, and we were both offered jobs in Baltimore at what was then the Spring Grove Hospital Center. And that was the same time, uh, this was the spring of, what, spring of, Spring of 67, maybe? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, then, uh, my wife Ilsa and I moved to Baltimore f from Boston. Uh, Stan Groff came just about the same week from uh, Prague. Um, uh, uh, Charles Savage had come from the West Coast, uh, it's before that. And there was, as a whole, this uh, team coming together to do research with psychedelics. Uh, Spring Grove had two uh, federal grants at that time, one for uh, research with LSD in the treatment of alcoholism, and one for uh, research with hospitalized uh, what we called neurotic patients, then people suffering from intense anxiety and depression. And so uh, it was uh, very exciting to be part of that, of that team. team. Right. And uh, uh, we felt at that time like we were on the threshold of uh, uh, something that would be very important and kind of revolutionize. Sure. Uh, psychology and uh, psychotherapy and uh, knowledge of consciousness and uh, uh, maybe we were right but we were, it took several decades longer than we uh, expected at that time. Uh, and then once I was living in Baltimore I still needed to get the doctorate so the only place that would where I could get a uh, PhD in my field um, and be licensed as a psychologist uh, as a part-time student was Catholic University. And that's how I came to uh, go to Catholic University okay. and my PhD was eventually granted. I, see. I, I read Catholic. that, yeah. You're right. Uh, but my, my work was so fascinating that after all, you know, I had already had almost five years of graduate study, and I, I just couldn't think of studying as a full-time student more because I wanted to do this research. Sure. And I also needed the income from the job, frankly. Right. You exactly. know? So uh, the research I was doing uh, ended up doubling as my doctoral dissertation. They, I did this work with uh, a short-acting psychedelic substance, dipropyl tryptamine, DPT, uh, in the treatment of the psychological distress of terminal cancer patients, which was incredibly uh, beautiful and meaningful work. Um, and that doubled as my uh, doctoral dissertation, but I would have done it even if I hadn't sure. done the dissertation. Right. Uh, and um, so that began 10 years of my life at the uh, Spring Grove, which became the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center around 1970, a new building was erected with state funding and all. And at the beginning, there was a lot of excitement that this was going to be a center for the study of altered states of consciousness. We had sensory isolation rooms and biochemical laboratories and 
uh, Room for Animal Research and uh, uh, two psychedelic treatment suites with uh, very comfortably furnished living rooms with kitchenettes and bathrooms and so on. It was kind of designed to, to be a center for the study of altered states. Um, as history un unfolded, uh, uh, that dream kind of got lost, um, mainly because of the political climate of the times, I think. Uh, there was so much drug abuse going on, it became more and more controversial that it was state-funded. Uh, like, what are we doing using state money to give people LSD? Um, and um, finally, the uh, I was there for 10 years. Um, and at the end, the, uh, it got, the staff got smaller and smaller until it was me and two secretaries. And then it became two secretaries, <laughs> and the research was the whole research center was transferred uh, from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to the University of Maryland, and there was a new director appointed. And uh, so there, there I was at a major uh, juncture of my life. Really, uh, I, I thought I would be sure. doing this forever, and now it's fizzled out to nothing. You know, there's a wonderful moment, perhaps you know it, in uh, uh, Wagner's Tristan and Isolde in the, uh, the Liebes Toad, where they, the music that's been soaring gets softer and softer and softer, and then there's just total silence, and there's a couple soft timpani uh, beats, and then very gradually the theme reads reintroduces itself and it grows and it grows. It's been a long time since I've yeah, heard that opera, it's but beautiful. I, I have heard it so much. Yep. Right. But that that's essentially captures what happened in psychedelic research there, where it looked like it was over. You know, this, uh, this was the last center in the United States where research was going on. And uh, that too had stopped. Not because the interesting, people often assume the federal government stopped it, and that's not true. We still had permission, uh, but there was no funding, there was no, no support. Technically, we had permission, but, the, you know, there, there was, the, there was no, there were no facilities, there were no uh, salaries to, to continue. Um, So, uh, in guiding people through sessions, and I, at, in those 10 years, I had worked with alcoholics, narcotic addicts, terminal cancer patients, hospitalized and outpatient neurotic patients. Um, uh, we had worked with mental health professionals in a training uh, uh, format and also religious professionals, professors of theology who wanted a safe, maximally, sure. uh, maximally safe and legal uh, psychedelic experience. Um, so many, several hundred people had had gone Can't through the clinic, and uh, we probably had a staff of. Uh, I know six, eight therapists at the at the height of it. And, uh, it was a very active. And it, the facility busy indicated place. was quite nice too. Yes, it was very nice. Right. Very beautiful, yeah. new building. But in guiding sessions, we would often tell people trust, let go, and be open. And so I decided, oops, time to practice what I preach. Time to apply this, you know, trust, let go, be open, you know. And so the research stopped. I published a few summary articles, and I thought, well, now what am I going to do, you know? Um, uh, so I, I moved into private practice. I um, spent more time practicing my piano and taking care of my garden and raising my kids. And uh, then I got a job teaching uh, 
in a master's psychology program at Antioch University in Columbia, Maryland, where they had a campus at that time. And I really enjoyed college teaching for about four years. And then Antioch closed up its operations in Maryland. Uh, Did you ever visit the main campus? Uh, I think I may have been okay. on it once, okay. but... Uh, what was the enrollment at that uh, satellite campus? About? I'm not sure. We, we, I, I was in a uh, program called Developmental Clinical Psychology, okay. and we had maybe 40, 50 students, mm -hmm. I would guess. Was this doing undergraduate and, and No, this was, this was a graduate. Graduate, okay. Uh, there also was a campus in Baltimore that was undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was the graduate campus? Yes, okay. right. And uh, as they were uh, phasing down, actually, I taught at both campuses. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, I, I discovered I really enjoyed teaching. Sure. Um, but then that closed, and I, so then I went into kind of full-time private practice, uh, which I, I have loved and continue to love. Sure. Uh, and everything was dormant until about 1969, 1970, when um, uh, Bob Jesse from the Council on Spiritual Practices in uh, San Francisco came to Baltimore and introduced Roland Griffiths and myself, who we were both in Baltimore, but we didn't know one another. And uh, Roland was a full professor at Johns Hopkins, had been there about 30 years, and uh, was a world expert in caffeine. Uh, but had very good relationships with federal agencies and was highly respected. And uh, together we uh, um, brainstormed about how we might get psychedelic research moving again. And uh, the Council on Spiritual Practices had some uh, kind of uh, brainstorming uh, conferences on the West Coast where all kinds of people got together who had either experience or ideas or funds or inspiration. And anyway, it culminated to uh, uh, Roland and I and Bob Jesse and consulting with others developing this protocol for a double-blind study with psilocybin. Uh, and we submitted it to the FDA, and it was approved, and uh, it went through the Hopkins Institutional Review Boards, and the Hopkins legal community wanted a special review of it, and, and we had to deal with uh, uh, the other federal agencies to deal with manufacturing the drug and having it transported and all that sort of stuff. but. We kept getting green lights, and all of a sudden, there I discovered myself once again uh, uh, doing uh, psychedelic research. And, uh, and we did this study with 38, uh, or 36, I think it was, uh, normal, healthy people in the Baltimore, Washington area. Uh, in a very well-designed, I like to say diabolically designed. I didn't know the final details of the design until it was over because I, I had to be blind as the clinician actually uh, m administering the drugs. Uh, but uh, it turned out the people either got a high dose of psilocybin or a high dose of Ritalin. Uh, but the expectation was that there could be any of about a dozen substances uh, administered, psilocybin being only one, and that psilocybin could be administered in different dose levels. So at the end of a session, I'd be asked to guess what the drug had been. And sometimes when it was Ritalin, I thought, oh, gee, well, maybe it was a very low dose of psilocybin. You know, but I, uh, it was... Uh, Anyway, the, the essence of the uh, research demonstrated that psilocybin really does do something unique, that it's not all expectation and suggestion, uh, that people who had 
psilocybin had, uh, many of them had these profound mystical experiences, much, many more than the group that received Ritalin. And that, um, and then we did a follow-up study 14 months later that said that these highly valued experiences had continued to, to be highly valued. And people rated them on the par of the birth of their children or uh, the death of a parent or mm -hmm. getting married. Like they were very momentous uh, moments in their in lives. Their lives yeah. Um, so uh, that our, the research at Hopkins is, is continuing uh, now that we've done. Uh, uh, after that initial study, we did a, 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 um, a dose response study where uh, uh, volunteers received uh, actually psilocybin on four, in four different doses randomly and a uh, placebo session uh, uh, randomly uh, administered um, that has demonstrated that it is indeed, of course, the higher doses that trigger the transcendental yeah. types of experience, but that even the, the low, uh, low dose of uh, five milligrams is, can trigger a significant experience. So though it's not likely to be transcendental or mystical. Um, and now we were, the work we did with cancer patients has come alive again. And, uh, Are you uh, doing some now at, with cancer patients? Yes, we okay. have a project right now for, uh, uh, people don't have to be terminal, uh, actually, though they can be, uh, but they have to have a diagnosis of cancer and have some a significant anxiety or depression, but it, which isn't all that hard to have when you right. have cancer. Any, it, no right. specific type of cancer? No, it can okay. be any, any form of cancer. And um, we provide, uh, you know, preparation and two psilocybin sessions and skill guidance and integration. And um, uh, often the, uh, the experiences that happen not only are very meaningful, but they, they help people uh, just live more fully whatever time is left, that they mm -hmm. uh, break through the denial in the families and they, there's more open, honest, genuine communication. And, um, but they're not necessarily terminal. They're no, open. no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. S some are terminal. Okay. Uh, but uh, ideally, we like to find people who have at least six months uh, sure. to live so we can get the, the data we need for research purposes. Right, yeah. Uh, so there's the cancer work, and then we're just starting uh, a, a new study uh, funded by the Fetzer Foundation uh, for normal, healthy people uh, focused on integrating uh, these transcendental experiences. So there's two groups, one that gets uh, just the support needed to ensure safety, basically. And then another group that gets intensive individual and group uh, support in taking these transcendental insights and trying to apply them to, to everyday living. Since we often say it's easy to love all mankind, you know, it's loving your spouse <laughs> and your boss <laughs> that gets gets to be challenging. <laughs> Something like that. What's the funding, the status on the funding? Have you been pretty successful from that standpoint for your projects? Um, well, that well the, the funding for the first study at, um, at Hopkins, Hopkins what was handled largely through uh, Bob Jesse and the Council on Spiritual Practices. Um, through private dino donations of sure. individual people who believed in our work. Uh, the cancer work is supported by the Hefter Institute. Um, uh, the, you know, Fetzer is trying, at least launching our, our funding with the uh, current spiritual development study. We have not been successful to date 
in accessing federal funding. Okay. Though we have, uh, we had a research protocol that was v rated very, very highly. Uh, but the the uh, d director of NIDA just chose other priorities, which is her right. Um, and uh, some people really understand what we're doing and deeply believe in it, and some people just don't quite so quite yeah, get it. That's you know? part of the challenge, isn't but it? But that's part of the challenge, <laughs> that's and right. hopefully the day will come when <laughs> uh, we will be able to uh, obtain federal funding. Sure. Right. And you mentioned earlier about publications. You've got quite an extensive list of publications, which is really very nice. Yeah, thank yeah. you. You're always working on some new ones then, right? Yeah. It takes a little bit of time once the project is done. Uh, that's <laughs> that's right. all publications do. That's right. Yeah. Let's talk a little about your family. You have a wife and you said children? I, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, my, my wife, uh, my, I should say my first wife, Ilza, um, died of cancer herself uh, when uh, she was 50. And uh, our children were 11 and 13 at this oh, time. Wow. We have two sons. And uh, I remember when it was diagnosed, and since we had worked with cancer patients and yeah. psychedelics, we kind of looked at one another and said, gee, if anyone can handle this, we ought to be able to, you know. But it's, it's very special when it comes to Right down to you, but she lived. She lived a decade after diagnosis, and it w lived very fully and had a very is a very good death uh, at home, very uh, peacefully and beautifully. Uh, though of course we felt it was premature, you know. So uh, after Ilza's death, I uh, I was then uh, single for seventeen years. And, uh, so you raised the children? Raised the kids okay. and uh, two sons, Dan and Brian. Dan is uh, a, uh, has his doctorate from Stanford and is a geneticist and a founder of a company called Ingenuity, uh, who he just came up with my first grandson. So there is married to a Chinese American woman, uh, Angela Chu. So there. There. I love to go to the West Coast and visit them whenever I can. Sure, right. And my younger son, uh, two years younger than Dan, Brian, uh, is a psychologist, a doctorate from uh, University of Denver, and also studied at Duquesne. Uh, and he uh, uh, works with me in the research now, uh, part-time. Uh, so, so he must live in the Maryland area. Then, yes, he does, and it's it's very wonderful to have him not only as son but as colleague. And That's right. Today he's covering my practice while I'm <laughs> here. It's great. That works out well. It works out <laughs> very very well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then after 17 years, I I, I did uh, talk myself into remarrying. Okay. Uh, had a very uh, uh, unsuccessful. A uh, year and a half, two year marriage, and that collapsed. And um, so it was a good lesson in humility. And uh, learned that in spite of my impeccable clinical skills, I could uh, make a bad choice. And uh, 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 life is moving on now. Right. I've yeah. been in a have and a very wonderful woman in my life at present, but good. we're not married yet. Yeah. Uh, awards and honors, are there any that you'd like to comment on? Sometimes I ask anything that's... Um, they haven't given me a Nobel Prize yet, no. no. You'll let us know. <laughs> 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 we'll promise a celebration. <laughs> are you, you're, well, you're a fellow in the American Psychological Association. That's quite nice. Yes. A fellow for that. Yeah. That's very good. Well, fellow, I think it's the Maryland Psychological Association. Right. And then you, are you still with the uh, American Psychological Association? Yeah, yes, yes, just that? just a member, uh -huh. right? You know, didn't hold any office. No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, okay. Haven't. Do you want to share with us? Do you have an outstanding event? An outstanding event. Anything special event. comes to mind? My life is full of outstanding events. Well, you can uh, have more than one. <laughs> 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 Most people do. Some people don't. <laughs> um. Hmm. 
just what what comes to mind is having been in in India about four years ago. Okay. And uh, uh, visiting, uh, I, I didn't get to meet His Holiness the the Dalai Lama. He was on retreat at that time, but I did I did get to spend time with his younger one of his younger brothers, uh, Tenzin. Uh, Shogal is his name, and his wife, uh, Rinjin Khandro, who's head of the Tibetan Nuns Project, and absolutely incredible people. Um, and there were many interesting and inspiring experiences there, just being in that part of the world, uh, <coughs> Dharamsala, and uh, up above in Maklad Ganj, where the Dalai Lama's compound is, where there's these snow-capped mountains and eagles soaring around and crystal pure uh, air. rivers and air, and very different from the heat of Calcutta or Bombay. You know, it's a very, very uh, wonderful part of India. Um, How long did you spend with there? I, I was just there maybe a month. Uh, uh, what I'm remembering is uh, uh, Bogsu Falls, this very wonderful waterfall where the waterfall just falls crystalline pure into this crystal clear basin and then it tumbles down the mountainside with uh, rapids and a pool and rapids and a pool. In tears almost. Yeah, in tears. And all along the river are uh, Tibetan monks bathing, some of them skinny dipping, <laughs> with their maroon robes kind of uh, spread out on the rocks to dry. And uh, the snow-capped mountains and the eagles, and you know, it's as close to heaven as you can find on this planet, <laughs> let me tell you. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah. a very beautiful experience. Um, uh, that's okay, that's good. I'll leave it. Uh, I think in, I'll let you summarize in any closing comments that you'd like to share. Over the time, anything that you look back or Let's something, see. some well, topics. Well, what's important about uh, my life? Um, I mean, there's always been uh, um, these different parts of me the clinician, the researcher, uh, the musician the parent, the, the home repair guy. I, I do pretty mean plumbing. <laughs> you know? Good to know. <laughs> you know? They hear the town. <laughs> right. And um, uh, I have some, sometimes I still say maybe when I, you know, I'm only 69 right now. So. But when I grow up, I still might be a musician, you know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but there's always been kind of this tension between the uh, the academician, the uh, psychologist, researcher, therapist part of me and the musician part of me. And uh, uh, actually, one of the uh, most profound transcendental experiences that have occurred in my, my life occurred uh, not not with a psychedelic, but in musical performance. When I was, uh, playing an organ recital and playing a uh, franc chorale, actually. And uh, I, I really believe that these states of mind are, they're not in the drugs, they're in us, you know. And uh, they can be accessed in many ways, and for many people they, they happen spontaneously, and mm. under, uh, both under periods of great stress and, and periods without significant stress. So I mean, uh, uh, Abraham Maslow just called them peak experiences, P-E-A-K. But uh, it's not only the uh, uh, 
uh, the people in the uh, religious robes that may have glimpsed them, but sometimes very ordinary people, your cleaning lady or your garbage man, <laughs> may have had these profound glimpses. But it seems, uh, in terms of the therapeutic import, where my interests are focused, it's clear that it's not the psychedelic drug that's important. Primarily, like, you know, you take aspirin to get rid of a headache. You don't take psilocybin or LSD to get rid of your addiction. You know, it's not that kind of relationship. But the, if with the help of these substances, you can trigger a uh, profound transcendental experience, uh, which, you know, I could define it, but I think you... You know, right. unity, transcendence of time and space, intuitive knowledge, sacredness, ineffability, uh, deeply felt positive. Mm -hmm. These very beautiful states. If, when that happens in someone's mind, uh, for the rest of their life they have a vivid memory of it. And there's, it changes something about how you feel about yourself, how you feel about other people, how you feel about the world. And these deep uh, noetic, William James's word, noetic insights, the intuitive knowledge, not only the reality of God and the reality of immortality or the indestructibility of consciousness, but there's a sense of the uh, brotherhood of man that somehow within consciousness we're all interrelated. Uh, and I think uh, in Hinduism they call it the, uh, the, um, was it the veil of Indra. You know, but this, this network uh, that somehow within the psyche, whatever the psyche is, we still haven't figured that out. Yeah. But uh, we all are very interconnected. And there's also the, the experience of such incredible beauty that when the person remembers that state of consciousness, um, it provides a fulcrum for behavior change and spiritual growth. It doesn't guarantee it, but it provides a, a yeah. initial. Right. An, a, an addict, for example, who experiences that can never view himself as worthless again or, or can't feel that there's anything he's done not even stealing from his grandmother, you know, that can't be forgiven, you know. And, uh, and there's also a, uh, uh, an experienced love in these profound transcendental states that I think can provide a basis for developing uh, ethics and empathy and, and relations. So uh, my own feeling is that these drugs have incredible potential in the future if they're wisely and responsibly used. Right. And I believe that's possible. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Oh, I appreciate welcome. that. This ends it. Thank you very much.